To some people, the horizon is as far as the eye can see. To others, it is as far as the mind can imagine. It is this characteristic, the urge to find out that which is yet unknown, that has driven man to push back the frontiers of space and knowledge. Whether he is questing into the future or delving into the past, man's unquenchable desire to test the limits of his environment is both his inspiration and his destiny. It is in this spirit that we dedicate this film to the 12 brave men of the Las Balsas expedition. Vital Alsar is a Spaniard, and his dream is to take three balsa wood rafts across the Pacific Ocean from Ecuador to Australia. If you want to do something extraordinary, something different, you must put all your heart into it. I am not afraid of critics and people who say that what I am doing is impossible. We are doing something that I think everyone would like to do. That is the biggest satisfaction in the world to have an idea and turn it into reality. Seven years ago, Vital attempted to cross the Pacific Ocean with one raft and sank near the Galapagos Islands. He and his three companions were lucky to escape with their lives. Four years later, he tried again, and to everyone's amazement, he succeeded. The object of the voyage was to show that the Indians of South America could have navigated across the Pacific in similar rafts hundreds and even thousands of years ago. To the experts, Vital's success was inconclusive, so he decided to challenge the Pacific one more time. On this expedition, Vital will take not one, but three rafts right across the Pacific to Australia. Starting in Guayaquil, Ecuador, the rafts will be carried by the Humboldt Current up to the Galapagos Islands, and then west across the Pacific with the prevailing winds and south equatorial current. The distance to Australia is 9,000 miles, the equivalent of crossing the Atlantic three times. If three rafts arrive in Australia, it will present clear evidence that balsa wood rafts could have been used to transport great numbers of people in ancient times. Many people say that we could not sail a raft all the way to Australia, but we did it. Now they say, it is impossible for three rafts to stay together. I don't know what will happen, but I believe in God and we will try to succeed. Above all else, Vital is a practical man, and he took great care in selecting the right companions for such an epic journey. Most important of all were the two men who would command the other two rafts. Twelve months before departure, they were decided on. Jorge Ramirez on the right is a Mexican and manages a record factory in Mexico City. The man on the left is Mark Modena. Mark comes from France and was with Vital on his two previous expeditions. When he isn't sailing rafts, Mark runs a restaurant in Montreal. Recruiting nine more crew members was a difficult and painstaking task for Vital knew that the biggest potential danger on a voyage of this nature was not the sea, but the men themselves. In an expedition like this, the toughest thing is the human element. The men don't have uh, to be supermen, just normal people. But the most important, they must have a good heart. With a good heart, a man can forget his own problems and think of the others. For two weeks, we met in Mexico so that I could prepare the men and see how they work together. I told them that if someone is not suitable, I can dismiss him, even at the last minute. A man could be a good man, but if he does not fit with the others, then he's a danger to everyone. I cannot risk that. 
When we leave, they must think, I have lost my life. Then, if we get to Australia, they can say, I took my life back again. In these days, we came to know each other, even though we did not all speak the same language. They were three Americans, three Canadians, one from Mexico, France, and Spain. I expect to get three more men in Ecuador, two Chilean and one Equatorian. The city of Guayaquil, once part of the fabled Inca Empire, is now the principal port of Ecuador. When the Spanish conquistadors arrived here in the early 16th century, they found the natives sailing balsa wood rafts up and down the coast with remarkable skill and precision. There is no clear account of how they did this, but the Las Balsas expedition will try to duplicate their methods as closely as possible. Guayaquil stands on the river Guayas, giving direct access to the sea, and most important of all, to the Humboldt Current, which will carry the rafts first north and then west out across the Pacific. The expedition made its base in a quiet backwater facing the river. Vital's plan was to clear the yard and construct three wooden ramps. The rafts would then be built on the ramps before being hauled into the water. From the moment we arrived in Guayaquil, we felt at home. Every person seemed to be a friend to the expedition. They understood what we were trying to do and that was a big encouragement. The people gave us some moral support, which was very, very important. To find the balsa wood trees they needed for building the rafts, Vital consulted Don Cesar Iglesias, a local timber merchant. Vital wanted seven trees for each raft as well as extra wood for traverses and supports. In the old days, balsa wood trees grew throughout the coastal region, but in modern times, the supply has been virtually exhausted. Don Cesar said that the only way to find the trees they required was to go into the interior and bring them out. As with the Indians before them, a long sea voyage began with a trek into the jungle. The success of the expedition and the lives of its members depended on their ability to find trees that were not only big enough for building the rafts, but would retain their buoyancy for five or six months at sea. tree was checked to see whether it was healthy. Several were rotted at the core and had to be rejected. Once they had been felled, the trees were stripped in the traditional Indian manner. All the trees were cut down at the time of the full moon, because that is when their sap content is at its highest. It is the sap in the logs that will prevent them from becoming waterlogged while they are at sea. They also took great care in choosing only female trees, which are lighter and therefore have better flotation. Living in these primitive conditions, the men had to fight the heat, mosquitoes and other discomforts. It was hard work, but as they all knew, this was nothing compared to what lay ahead. After 12 days in the jungle, their task was completed. 34 balsa wood logs had been cut down and prepared for the journey to Guayaquil. Resting in the relative comfort of a banana plantation, the men had time to relax and reflect on the future. 
The long uh, trip like this, you must not think of yourself. You, first, you have to think of 11 other persons. And you give everything you can for them. And then what's left, it's for you. Each guy is actually the mother, the father, the, the brother, and, and everything, and the relative to the other. And uh, it's a great big family, and it has to function as a big family. There are no roads in the jungle, and the only way to get the logs to Guayaquil was by river. The journey was slow and even more uncomfortable than their days in the jungle. At night, they would tie up at the bank and try to sleep, but the ants on the logs made this virtually impossible. They managed to brew some coffee and lived off fresh fruit taken from the banana plantation. The trip to Guayaquil took three days and two nights. The delay in finding suitable trees had cost the expedition almost a week of construction time. Now there were only three weeks in which to build, equip, and provision the rafts. They could not change the date of departure because of the risk of unfavorable currents and dangerous weather conditions later in the voyage. Time was short, and construction proceeded with added urgency. <laughs> Vital was meticulous in building the rafts only with materials that were available to the Huancavilca Indians. However, to save time, he enlisted local help in securing such specialized items as Wayakun wood for the mast blocks and mangle wood for the masts themselves. <laughs> There are no plans available for building an authentic Indian raft, but Vital had studied the problem for many years and had the invaluable experience of two previous voyages to draw upon. The rafts would be 39 feet long and 17 feet wide with a bamboo deck and a small hut for living quarters. No wire, screws, or metal materials of any kind were used in the construction. To secure the logs, Vital used sisal ropes, which were manufactured locally in the same way as those used by the Indians centuries ago. The sisal comes from a cactus plant called kabuya. It is shredded into long strands and then woven together to make ropes which are not only strong, but extremely pliable. To make an expedition is not to have an idea and then you go out and do it. For an expedition like this, you have to work for months and years. You must make the steps so that you can climb up and succeed. The Equatorian Indians had thousands of years experience with rafts. Our knowledge was very small, but we did our best to copy their methods of construction. Everything they did had a practical purpose. The huts were built entirely of bamboo to keep them cool. One discovery that Vital made was that instead of using a rudder, the Indians had devised a system of guaras, or keel boards, which were inserted between the logs to help steer the raft. Thinking of the months ahead, Fernand Robichaud, the electronics expert from Canada, took the precaution of testing the plumbing arrangements. The crews were complete and the rafts ready for launching, but right up to the last moment there were people coming to volunteer for the expedition. I was wondering about the expedition and why women wouldn't be allowed to, to go on the rafts. What are the reasons that you have for saying that only men are strong enough physically and mentally mm -hmm. to, to take the trip, the six month trip? Maybe I am wrong in, uh, because I don't take women with us, but uh, we will take women in our heads in our heart. Yeah. 
You mean you say that it would be like a whole nother expedition to see whether men and women could make it across? Well, we have That's experience on land. We have experience on land that women and men uh, have problems and, on the raft. Going. And I think there's a lot of problems on land. I, I think it's just a fantastic thing. and. Uh, it's almost beyond the realm of believability to be able to do it. Do you know the risks? Ah, uh, yes, I know the risks. You know how long will uh, the trip can uh, be? Six, eight months. Six six months. months. Around six months. Yeah. Or maybe the whole life. From the greatest super tanker to the smallest dugout canoe, the moment of launching is a nerve-wracking affair. Would all the ropes and pegs hold? Would the logs ride evenly in the water? First to be launched was the Guayaquil, named after the port of departure. Next came the Mululuba named for the intended point of arrival in Australia. Last was the Aztlan, named after Mexico, where the expedition first assembled. Skidding sideways as it was towed into the water, the Aztlan came close to wiping out some of the more enthusiastic onlookers. Once they were floating safely in the river, there was no time to be lost. In two days, they would have to accomplish what had been planned for a week. The masts were fitted early next morning, but there hardly seemed time to complete all that had to be done by two o'clock. The sails were painted with the emblem of the expedition, a blazing sun with three rafts under sail. Vital added the initial D in honor of his wife, Denise. Vital and Denise had been married only two days before his first expedition in 1966. Friends brought two small monkeys as mascots for the journey. Others brought fruit, vegetables and supplies. Although Vital wanted to make the expedition as authentic as possible, he did not feel that this required his crew to imitate the Juan Cavilcas in every detail. He knew that they had eaten dried foods that are not now available and that they stored water in hollow bamboo poles attached to the decks, which would have been more than enough to reach Australia. We will take water and food for about 60 days, but most of the time we will leave uh, from the sea. There will be plenty of fish, turtles and uh, things like that, and uh, we will have a lot of water from rain. It is not hard to live on the sea if you understand that it is a friend and not an enemy. Now, Mr. Elso, I'm from the Australian Embassy in Lima, mm -hmm. and we've on very short notice learned that of your impending departure, and so that uh, you may not encounter any particular problems or to make things easier in the granting of entry facilities, I've brought up these documents, which I would like you and your crew members to fill out and perhaps return to me as soon as possible before you leave. Maybe. Four or five in the, in the afternoon is good for you? Yes, I, sh I shall come at five o'clock. What happens then? if we go to Australia without visa? We we'll reach Australia on the rafts. Do you have visas? No, come back. Just a joke. <laughs> During the last minute preparations, a four seat rowing skull appeared on the scene. The three Americans who had rowed together at school in Philadelphia decided to give it a try. What I really liked about it was Michael, Tom, and I jumping into the same boat because it brought so many memories of St. Joe's and the old collegiate days when we raced together. It was almost irresistible, the temptation not to jump in and, and get together one more time, you know, but it was sort of a, a very memorable farewell. To keep the monkeys company, there were three kittens, one for each raft. There wouldn't be any mice at sea, but they'd have plenty of fresh fish. Before breaking for lunch, Vital assigned crews for each raft. En the pass in la in la Guayaquil, conmigo. Greg, you go with me 
en la Andorraf de Guayaquil, uh -huh. with uh, El Gato, Thomas McCormick, Aníbal en the same raft. Great. Michael, you go with Mark, with Fernand, Gaston Collins. You go to Vera. Right? Great, great. If you don't want, the jump to Okay. <laughs> it's okay. We change during the voyage, maybe every week we change. A man from the raft, Aztlan, to the Mulaba, to the Guayaquil, and we will uh, rot in all the way from here to Australia. Okay? Fine, fine. Great. For the last time, the 12 men of Las Balsas sat down to eat with their wives, friends, and relatives. They had eaten together in this restaurant every day since their arrival in Guayaquil six weeks before. If all went well, the next meal around a table would be in Australia. For the wives, there was a particular strain and anxiety. Now that day going, I feel alone and a little afraid about what's going to happen in the six months that I'm going to be separated from Michael. Anibal Guevara, the Ecuadorian. Mark Modena and his wife, Bertha. Gabriel Salas, a geologist from Chile. Greg Holden, a 21-year-old student from Manitoba and the baby of the expedition. For everyone, it was an ending and a beginning, a mixture of sadness and anticipation. Now everyone knew that the waiting was over, the adventure was about to begin. The expedition included men from seven nations, but they would sail under a white flag, symbolizing the unity and brotherhood of man. A last minute salute from Salvador Dali, one of the patrons of the expedition. Perhaps were towed downriver to begin their journey to the sea. The sounds of the city fade slowly behind them. I think we will succeed in crossing the Pacific. But when I evaluate the possibility, 12 men, three rafts, the possibilities of all of us surviving the trip are very slim. Now they travel, and I know that they are going to be really happy and without any trouble. Everybody trusts Vital. I don't know what Vital has, but everybody trusts him. I would never make an expedition if I was not sure that we could succeed. If 11 people trust me, then I must be responsible and know what I am doing. Because as well as the 11 men, there are their families and uh, mine, and all the people who helped and trusted us. The men were finally on their own with the full breadth of the Pacific between them and their ambitious dream.
In the rush departure, many of the stores and provisions had been mixed up and placed on the wrong rafts. For the first week, a lot of time was spent in sorting things out and making sure that everyone had what they needed. The beginning was a difficult time for everyone. Even after they had got their sea legs, it was hard to settle down. Finding out the best way to cook or handle the sail was a slow process of trial and error. Mash up some fish, make it with some potatoes, a little flour. Gradually, the men began to adapt to their new environment. Living in such a confined space was not going to be easy for anyone. From Guayaquil, the rafts headed north, carried along in the Humboldt current and assisted by favorable winds. The rafts were handling well, though not yet tested by the elements in an angry mood. As they approached the Galapagos Islands, the first turtle made an appearance. This was just a friendly visit, but later on, hunger would drive the raftsmen into looking upon turtles as a source of food. Twenty-one days out of Guayaquil, they sighted land. Flocks of birds welcomed them to the Galapagos Islands, an archipelago forever associated with Charles Darwin and his theory of evolution. The Humboldt Current had brought the rafts to the threshold of the Pacific from where it was hoped that the trade winds and south equatorial current would carry them 3,000 miles west to the Marquesas Islands, the second leg of their projected voyage. Soon after Galapagos, the rafts had a truly spectacular visitor, a spotted whale shark. This one was only about 24 feet long, but the extremely rare whale shark is the largest known fish in the world today and can grow to 70 feet and weigh as much as 20 tons. The whale shark swam under the raft from side to side. Sometimes it rubbed its back against the bottom of the raft. We were a little worried, but uh, it seemed quite friendly. I tried pushing it away, but in the end, we just relaxed and watched it swim up and down, having fun. It soon became obvious that rust was going to be a problem. The water cans were cleaned off and better protected against the elements. Food cans received the same attention, but later on they would find that these efforts were not enough. On calm days, they would get out a dinghy and go visiting. Vital liked to compare notes on navigation and see how things were going on the other rafts. The formalities of social protocol were always scrupulously observed. Although treated in a lighthearted manner, these visits were very important for keeping up morale and making sure that everyone was in good shape. Rafts were now averaging 50 miles a day, eight with the current and 42 by sail. In the long months ahead, the sea would test them physically and mentally to the limit. Really, it is a wonderful feeling to be alone on the sea. On a raft, you feel a, a part of the sea. You feel happy and afraid at the same time. But most of all, you feel wonder at the power and the beauty of nature. You realize that a lot of our values on land are wrong because you see very clearly that compared to nature, man is very small and unimportant. The men had begun to think of the ocean as their own private world when one morning they encountered a small sailboat. 
After six weeks at sea, they had become accustomed to the isolation and solitude of life on the rafts. And the sight of outsiders was a little disconcerting. When the boat came closer, they were even more surprised to find that his crew consisted of a young man, a girl, and a German shepherd. Their visitors offered to mail letters written by the Las Balsas crew when they reached the Marquesas, and in return, Mark presented them with a freshly caught Dorado. There was little time for the crews to get acquainted, but the human contact was comforting and reassuring. The novelty of the meeting had hardly had time to wear off before the sailboat was on its way, leaving the men alone once more on the empty ocean. It had been Vital's plan from the beginning to rotate the crews during the voyage. This was intended as a psychological stimulant to prevent the men from going stale or drifting into a lazy routine. If necessary, it could also be used to avoid friction or tension building up on any of the rafts. The idea of changing raft was unpleasant to every one of us because we made the raft our home. We got used to everyone's habit on the raft, cooking, everything. We got but use it, the taste was sort of routine life, some form of security for everyone. Then when uh, the moment came to change Raf, it was sort of a shock. But after the change, every one of us discovered that it's a good idea because we get to know other people, new ideas, new ways of cooking, and new ways of doing things. After a short while, the idea of changing Raf was a very good one because it, it helped everyone. From the first week, sea life began to grow on the rafts. In one way, this was a danger because sea worms could eat into the logs and make them become waterlogged. But in another way, it, it was good because it helped to feed us. If we put a barnacle on a small hook, we could catch a pilot fish between the logs. Then, if we put the pilot fish on a bigger hook, we could catch a dorado or tuna. This is uh, how we fed ourselves most of the time. The law of the sea is the same as on land. The big fish live of the small ones. Always the strongest survive. We watched the cycle of life around us every day, and then we realized that uh, we had become a part of the circle. Yeah. Sharks were always a problem as far as fishing was concerned. Quite often the men would catch a fish only to see it swallowed by a shark before they could haul it in. They lost a lot of hooks and lines this way. As the supply of hooks ran out, the men were obliged to manufacture new ones from whatever they could lay their hands on. Worse than taking the hooks though, the sharks would frighten away the dorado and other fish, which the expedition depended on for their food supply. Only in these circumstances would they deliberately kill a shark. Killing a shark was never easy. They were very strong and very dangerous. If anyone fell overboard, they knew what was waiting behind. There was no way for the rafts to go back against the current and unless a man could swim to the lifeline behind each raft, he knew that he was lost. One night, a man, Gaston Collin, fell overboard and saved himself that way. He was lucky because there were no sharks near the raft. From the beginning, everybody understood that we take only what we need. If one man caught a fish, it was too big, it was divided among the three rafts, so that would take care of the uh, eating for that one day. So we never ever did it, never became a sport just for uh, killing fish. Fish was the staple diet on the rafts, usually dorado, and occasionally tuna or barracuda. Everyone took turns at cooking, and menus varied according to nationality and personal taste. 
The biggest problem in preparing a meal was trying to find a new way to cook the same basic food. The Americans sometimes put marmalade on the fish to change its taste. But eating was a serious matter and everyone did their best to prepare something interesting. Life aboard was not easy and the relaxation of meal times offered a welcome relief from the discomfort of the tiny cabin and the constant struggle with the elements. A lot of the cooking was done using pure seawater, which didn't seem to spoil the flavor of the food in any way. They also drank seawater from time to time to make up for the salt their bodies were losing through dehydration. In no case were there any ill effects. More than anything else, life on the rafts meant a lot of hard work. Apart from regular shifts on the sail, the men spent a great deal of time looking after the rafts themselves. This meant constantly checking the logs, ropes, lamps, and anything else that could deteriorate and jeopardize their safety. When the rafts were taken care of, they attended to their own needs. The two most important activities were fishing and preparing food. And since there was no doctor on the expedition, the men took special care to keep fit and protect their health. This was no easy task in such a confined space, but with good humor and a little ingenuity, each man found his way. To plot their course across the Pacific, the expedition depended on astral navigation using a sextant. Their modern instruments gave the Las Balsas crew an advantage over the South American Indians they were trying to emulate. However, it is known that the Indians had an advanced knowledge of astronomy, and they were certainly aware of the prevailing winds and currents. One Spanish chronicler spoke of the Incas describing the Pacific as a jungle with many paths. Certainly their skill and experience at sailing rafts was greater than that of any modern man. And who knows what problems they had at home that drove them to dare the unknown and seek the lands they believed to lie to the West. During the course of the voyage, the men discovered more sophisticated methods of catching fish. We started experimenting with, uh, with a harpoon by moving it on the surface of the water. After trying half a dozen rhythms, we found that one particular type did attract a fish. It didn't hold them for long. They would get close enough to investigate. They're just close enough that we could uh, harpoon them. It was very hard to hit a fish with a harpoon because of the reflection in the water. But in time, you learn to, uh, to adapt to these distances. It's just a matter of practice. Food was always a preoccupation on the rafts, and they were always thinking of ways to supplement their normal diet. And Ebel said, we ought to salt some fish because we're going to have problems. We'll have the dried fish to, to eat in case we have problems fishing. We salted the fish by just filleting it and then sprinkle the salt on it. You know, you cover it well with salt and then leave it in the sun, dry it out for two days, three days, until you, you knew it was dried and then you could eat it. So we had this uh, salted fish, which we, you could eat without cooking. You know, you just take a piece off and chew it so you could sustain yourself. Or you could cut it up and put it into uh, a soup, anything you wanted to do with it. It was very good. 
The rafts were now almost a third of the way to Australia, but no one was taking it easy. Ahead of them lay the Marquesas and the hidden reefs and violent storms of the West Pacific, a stretch of ocean feared by sailors throughout the ages. Every day the sea produced a new surprise. This was a snake mackerel, complete with bulging eyes and long, sharp teeth. Only a few of these strange fish have ever been seen before. Vital's birthday fell on the 72nd day of the voyage, and nobody missed the opportunity of reminding him that he was now 40. Birthday greetings poured in and were gracefully acknowledged. Hugo Becerra, one of the two Chilean geologists on the expedition, had even carved a gift for the occasion, a model balsa raft. <laughs> the longer they were at sea, the closer the men of Las Balsas came to identify with the creatures around them. None appeared friendlier or more interested in the rafts than the whales. These were only small whales, but their big brothers displayed the same friendly interest. Floating across the sea on wooden logs, several of the men sensed a growing affinity between the fish and themselves. The whales, uh, we didn't see them very often, but when we did see them, they used to uh, come in groups of two or three. They would sometimes swim under the rafts, swim around the rafts. I don't know if it was out of just curiosity or where they were investigating us, or they were actually so intelligent that they were playing games with us. In time, they just got so brazen that they would come up to the side of the raft. For some reason, none of us really feared them because they knew that we meant no harm and we knew they meant no harm. One whale actually came up and Mike just started petting it. We were just so fascinated because the whale offered no resistance. It just stayed there, almost like a, a peace sign, letting us touch it. Watching the whales and uh, seeing how friendly they were with us, it was sad to think that man has driven them close to extinction. Perhaps there is still time to save uh, them and uh, get back a little for our self-respect. strong winds, the rafts were now making 60 to 80 miles a day. Their progress was exhilarating, but there was a price to be paid. The faster they went, the sooner they would reach Australia. But at the same time, the greater their speed, the more severe the strain on the rafts themselves. Attending to the constant wear and tear became the number one priority. approaching the Marquesas Islands. It was 84 days since they left Guayaquil, and they had covered 4,000 miles. Next morning, the men of Las Balsas caught their first sight of land in seven weeks. Gabriel, can you smell the land? Yeah. Trees. What a way. What a way to go. Look at that. I wish these clouds would clear off a little. It's the sun to roll back in. As the, as the clouds up here, it's clearing up there. Yeah. Can you see the point, Gabriel? Yeah, I see. Very clear now. Look at the green, though. Doesn't that set your mind? Beautiful. The green. Look at the other points right behind those. No taxes, no politicians. It's all green. 
Passing through the islands, the rafts were visited by a Canadian sailboat, the Seeker, out of Vancouver. On board was Bruce Jaffrey, his wife, and four children. Riding waves eight to 10 feet high, the Seeker approached the rafts. After all this time at sea, the men on the rafts were touched by the generosity and kindness of these complete strangers. It was a real thrill to see a family working together like that. They were real sailors. They didn't know us from a, a hole in the wall, but they appreciated what we were doing, and they were, they were super kind to us. To have these people here was like a touch from home. They baked us a, a cookies and a loaf of bread. It was really sort of, we came back into the world for a brief moment. Having visited each raft, the seeker turned back for port. More important than the cookies or fresh fruit, the meeting had warmed the hearts of 12 men who still had to face 5,000 miles of the most treacherous ocean in the world. With the Marquesas Islands behind them, the expedition was now embarked on the most perilous section of the voyage. The passage through the Samoa Islands, the Fijis, and the New Hebrides is scattered with thousands of submerged reefs. To guide the rafts through this coral jungle would require expert navigation as well as a lot of luck. In daylight, it would be possible to spot reefs ahead, but at night, there would be no warning. The most they could do was to study their charts and hope for the best. until now, some of the men began to develop rashes and sores. Others were struck by nausea. The cause was traced to the tin food, which had become contaminated and had to be jettisoned. The rusty cans represented a serious loss, but there was no choice in the matter. Soon afterwards, they suffered another loss. One of the monkeys was killed in a storm. It had climbed down among the stores for protection and was crushed when a water container fell on it. A few days later, and a new problem developed on the Malulaba. In a fit of temper, Lulu had bitten Mark on the hand. You can see him getting nervous and a little excited. He would be screaming all the time. And possibly this is what happened. He was getting sick. The monkey was maybe getting a bad infection. And since we were without a doctor in the middle of the ocean, Mark and Vital realized that the thing to do is we'd have to put the monkey to sleep. We didn't have the drugs to take care of a monkey. We didn't have it. They had already tried, I think, giving him something and it, was, it just wasn't working. There was too much of a risk involved, and it was sad that they put the monkey to sleep. The sadness was felt on every raft. They had come so far with Lulu. To lose her by their own hands was a bitter blow. The crew of the Guayaquil threw medicine over to Mark for his bite wound. But for the next few days, everyone was depressed. <laughs> Tripulación, pobres marinos, pobres pedazos de 
los llevo, señor capitán. De mi Al palo más alto, al palo más alto del gran bergantín, del gran bergantín. Ya. The three kittens had grown into healthy cats. They had become perfectly adapted to life on the rafts, and the only assistance they required was an occasional bath. After the bath came a clipping to get rid of all the tangles. Piku was very self-conscious about her appearance and would go and hide in a corner until she was dry. For precise navigation, each raft depended on an accurate watch or chronometer. From time to time, they would signal to each other to check Greenwich Mean Time. This was an odd-looking exercise at the best of times, but when Gabrielle was making the signals on the Aztlan, the whole thing took on the appearance of a comic opera. The rafts had now been at sea for a hundred days and had covered 5,200 miles. They were still in good condition but required constant attention. They had a full day out there every day and there was a constant need to repair the ropes and uh, keep the logs clean to prevent people from falling overboard or falling and, and breaking a bone, especially when we hit the rougher water. The movement of the logs loosened some of the planks and we felt that it, as long as we didn't let the ropes get out of hand or uh, the planks come loose or something like that, the rafts would stay together and get us there. Okay. Okay. It was very rare we could have a swim because of the sharks. But sometimes if we were out of the current and there were no sharks around the rafts, some of the men would swim. But always we keep a man on the lookout with a harpoon. Vital and Mark were more prudent in their methods for keeping cool. Bucket showers served the same purpose and eliminated the possibility of an unpleasant surprise. Every day, Vital would plot their progress. Each raft was responsible for its own navigation, but as the leader of the expedition, Vital made all decisions concerning the course and direction they should steer. The speed of the rafts could vary considerably, depending on the direction and force of the wind and the strength of the current. It was Vital's responsibility to choose the course that would take the best advantage of these various elements. Heading towards the Cook Islands, the rafts passed over the meridian of 160 degrees. This was two-thirds of the way towards their goal, and a good excuse for a party. 
Each man took his turn at being baptized into the exclusive brotherhood of raftsmen. Gabriel, Mark, and Vital, veterans of previous voyages, acted as high priests in the initiation ceremonies. Soy Balsero. Soy Balsero. Seré Balsero. Seré Balsero. Y no dejaré que la vela flote. De Astral. De Guayaquil. Y de Mulunabá. No, vamos a dar arranco. Yo de su lado me acabé de chupa. Ok. To top out the celebration, Mark and Vital gracefully confirmed their own membership in the Brotherhood. <laughs> Several times during the journey, the men of Las Balsas were surprised to find birds out in the ocean, hundreds and even thousands of miles from the nearest land. There was a bird, I think they call them sparrows of the sea. And in French, we call them the hirondelles de la mer. We fed it once and then it kept coming back, day after day. We found out also that that same bird would go from one raft to the other, getting his uh, portion of uh, food. But one day just disappeared. Uh, we didn't see it anymore. The sharks were always with them, menacing and dangerous. Gaston had lost his upper dentures overboard. Greg extracted some teeth from the dead shark, thinking they might be of some use to his Canadian buddy. Gaston declined the offer with the embarrassed smile he used to avoid showing his missing teeth. The rafts were now south of Tonga, sailing west into increasingly heavy seas. Building up, the question in the back of everyone's mind was, will the sails and rigging stand the strain? survived the impact and was still intact by the morning. Two of the keelboards had been snapped off like matchsticks, but otherwise the raft was undamaged. They come inside and from here they have the water. 
The storm had blown itself out, and everyone was beginning to relax when Gaston reported one raft missing. Scanning the horizon, there was no sign of the Malulaba. Vital tried to contact the missing raft by radio without success. With Mark Modena on the Mululaba were Fernand Robichaud, Anibal Guevara, and Tom Ward. The Guayaquil and Aztlan took down their sails and put out sea anchors. They would wait and pray, hoping that the lost raft was safe and would be able to join them. There was not much you could actually do other than hope that nothing happened. You felt this huge absence that they weren't there. We had come this far with three rafts. It wasn't two rafts to be missing this uh, other raft and these other men. It was like missing a leg. You just couldn't get around it. Vital stayed on the radio talking to the ham radio network, which kept repeating their position in case the Malulaba could hear them. Time passed very slowly, but there was nothing they could do except maneuver in the current and wait. On the third day, a shark circled them repeatedly. No one had to talk to know what the others were thinking. By the fifth day, morale was very low. If the Malulaba did not show up soon, they would have to go on alone. Suddenly, there was a shout from Gaston. He had seen a sail. And there it was, the missing raft. I can't express how every one of us felt. We had almost given up hope. Now we were all together again. It was a, a wonderful moment, really very wonderful. As the rafts came together, the story of those five days was told. During the storm, the Malulaba's boom had broken, and next morning they found themselves alone on the sea. The radio was out of order, and it seemed that they would have to struggle on alone. Eventually, they repaired the damage got the radio working well enough to pick up the position of the other rafts from a radio ham. The rest of the story was lost in the happy reunion. The rafts were now on the last lap of their journey. After the storm of Tonga, they felt that nothing could stop them. Tom McCormick on the lookout for sharks. Gaston hangs over the edge to do some underwater photography. The rafts were now riding very low in the water as the sea began to penetrate the logs. The net attached to the safety line was for gathering plankton. Prepared as soup, this made a valuable supplement to their regular diet. Gaston had been filming for less than a minute when a shark came cruising into his field of vision. camera on board, Gaston withdrew without waiting for a close-up. The deterioration in the condition of the rafts was now very noticeable. The sails had to be patched and mended at every opportunity. Repairs were difficult because of a lack of materials and one solution was to saw up some of the keel boards and use them as reinforcements. Worst of all, sea worms had gotten into the ropes and logs. 
Everyone knew they were fighting a losing battle. It was simply a matter of time before the rafts would sink. The only question was how long the process would take. For Mark Modena, the big problem was a lack of tobacco. As a substitute, Mike Fitzgibbons ground up some coffee beans for Mark to smoke in his pipe. Week by week, the problem grew worse until Mark was eventually reduced to smoking palapa leaves from the roof of the hut. Five hundred miles from Australia, they were circled by a Danish tanker. Uh, a blonde came out of the cabin and threw something in the water. Well, we didn't know what it was. He sort of debated for a second, well, should we go get it? I said, well, Mark, I'll go get it, because I, I could row the dinghy pretty well, and I jumped in, jumped in our dinghy, and I went back to get it. All the heavy smokers were praying for cigarettes. Fernan came down from the top of the mast in high hopes of a relieving puff. The crew of the Malulaba were standing by, eager to welcome Mike back on board. Yeah, I kind of wish for Mark's sake that it would be something like maybe a, a few cigarettes or something that would uh, ease the situation on the rafts. Well, I didn't open it up because I wanted everybody to be surprised. At the same time, I was. It was light. I couldn't figure out what was in it. We were all excited to see what this blonde had thrown to us. Any moment now, and the mystery would be solved. Off comes the top, and inside is a note. The message to the men of Las Balsas reads, I would like to join you. Please write. Have plenty of money. An address was enclosed. It was good for a laugh, but raftsmen are hard to please. It was a nice thing, but you couldn't smoke it. Mm -hmm. The last birthday to be celebrated during the trip was that of Hugo Becerra, the Chilean. The weather was calm and the rafts were tied up to enable everyone to come on board the Guayaquil. During the voyage of Las Balsas, every birthday was a special occasion. As well as the chance of everyone getting together, a party was like a milestone celebrating their continued survival at sea. Minette did not understand this and preferred to stay at home. Mark had created a special dish for the occasion, and everyone brought along a big appetite. As a souvenir of the occasion, each man signed the wooden pulley that was to be given to Hugo as a birthday gift. The presentation was made in a formal ceremony that characterized every important event during the voyage. With all this noisy activity, Minette changed her mind and swam over to join in the party. The last bottle of wine was taken from storage, and everyone drank to Hugo's good health and the success of the expedition. They had come 8,500 miles, and there was a great deal to be thankful for. Following the toasts, everyone got down to the serious business of eating and drinking. It was a very enjoyable party, but most of us felt a bit sad because we foresaw the moment when we would uh, go each, our, each one our way and uh, when we would be separated. We had gone through such a fantastic human experience. We didn't, uh, didn't want to believe that it wouldn't last. It would stop like this by our arrival in Australia. I suppose most of us felt or wished it would go on forever. <laughs> Four hundred miles from their destination, the rafts were met by an Australian TV crew. Forty-four hours sailing from Malulaba, and we found what we were looking for. First one speck, 
then another, then a third. And just as Vital Alsa had said, Las Balsas was drifting slowly, ever so slowly, 400 miles off the Queensland coast and still a long way to go before journeys end. While the Australians made their way across to the Guayaquil, the other people on their boat took the opportunity of distributing fresh fruit and vegetables to the men of Las Balsas. Most important of all, they sent over generous supplies of beer, an essential element of life in this part of the world. Change maybe uh, some ropes. The ropes are a little tired. Yeah. Because it's a lot of... Uh, the terreros are inside of the ropes. We sort of felt that we were in Australia because it, this boat had come out to welcome us and we, we knew we weren't there on the land, but we were at the doorstep. And uh, we, we didn't really realize what was going to happen after that. After a four hour visit, the boat was on its way back to Australia, leaving everyone in good spirits. With fair winds, the rafts were expected to reach Malulava in five or six days. Unhappily, when the TV boat departed, so did the wind. In the next three days, the rafts covered little more than 20 miles. All they could do was drift and wait. Seven days after the visit of the TV boat, they had made barely 50 miles. They tried to be patient, but as all sailors know, there's nothing you can do in a sailboat without the cooperation of the wind. The condition of the logs was not reassuring. They were rapidly becoming waterlogged, and there was no way of knowing how long it would be before they sank. Ah. On the eighth day after they lost the wind, a breeze sprang up from the southwest. To make the best use of it, they moved their sails over to the left-hand side of the rafts and in the next 24 hours, they covered 52 miles. Now they were on the move again, and everyone's thoughts turned towards Australia. The next morning, the wind had died down and they were drifting again, making only a few miles a day. They were only 100 miles from the coast, so near and yet so far. The rafts had run out of fuel for the cookers, so the Ostlan improvised a stove that did the cooking for all of them. But even with this stove, the food situation was beginning to cause anxiety. They had finished their provisions several days before, thinking that the voyage was over, and now there weren't even any fish to catch. One afternoon, a bird flew onto the Malulaba. It appeared to be injured, but surprisingly, the cat looked upon it not as a potential meal, but as a possible playmate. Tom McCormick did what he could to make it comfortable, but it wouldn't eat or drink anything. The rats were now being trailed by sharks all the time. They tried to catch one to eat, but without success. If this went on for much longer, the food situation could become serious. The bird died after two days on board, and Piku and Minette were sorry to lose a friend. Every day, Vital plotted their progress. Five miles one day, ten miles the next. The frustration dragged on for five weeks. The rafts had been in a perfect position to reach Malulaba. 
All they had needed was one day of wind, but it never came. The rafts were now drifting south in the busy shipping lanes that run down the east coast of Australia. During the last 24 hours, they had drifted past Mooloolaba and Brisbane. They could see the coast, but there was no wind to take them ashore. At this point, it was decided that the rafts were a hazard to shipping, and the Australian Navy was ordered to tow them in. Frustrated by the wind, the rafts lowered their sails and waited to be picked up. They were only eight miles from land. The elements had had the last word. planes flew overhead, dipping in salute and welcoming them to Australia. It was hard for some of the men to realize that it was over. During the night, a Navy vessel arrived with two trawlers and took the rafts in tow. Next morning, the small fishing port of Ballina woke up to find itself the center of national attention. by small pleasure craft, the rafts were home from the sea, 9,213 miles from Guayaquil to Ballina, the longest raft voyage in history. There were no prizes or financial profits for the men of Las Balsas, but their voyage is a reminder that for men of generous spirit, Achievement is its own reward. With an open mind and an open heart, there is no peak to which man cannot aspire. We had shown that the rafts could have been navigated as a means of transport thousands of years ago. If we could come to Australia on balsa wood rafts, the people of South America could have done the same even better than us. We were men from seven countries, and we went more than 9,000 miles together. <laughs> we started the journey as friends and ended it as brothers. We did what we had set out to do, and that was enough. We were very happy. But most of all, we had given an example. I think a good example to people everywhere. What we did was perhaps not very important, but we showed that if you believe in something good, you can do it. You can turn dreams into reality. Pacific on the raft is uh, very nice, but it's very hard. And we are very, very, very happy to be on land. We want to be in Mulova. We are with our heart in the whole Australia. We are in Mulova at the same time. And now we have the opportunity to see Balina. And we will never forget uh, your faces 
Uh, your city. Thank you very much.